Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be discussing a very important topic, suicide prevention and resources in an effort to raise awareness and share important information that could save lives. So today we're joined by special guest, Clara Reynolds, President and CEO of the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay, Dr. Daniel uh, Reidenberg, uh, Executive Director of SAVE, the Suicide Awareness Voices of Education in Minnesota, and Christina Judge, Executive Director of the Jordan Elizabeth Harris Foundation in Texas. So thank you all for joining us and let's open the discussion with a warning for anyone who has attempted or knows someone who has attempted suicide we will be discussing how people come to consider suicide prevention resources, and we'll talk frankly about what we can all do to see distress and help those we love. If you'd like to leave this virtual room, we understand, and you have our support. So we all need motion, emotional support, particularly when times get rough, and we all need a helping hand to heal. We've gone through this COVID pandemic, and this has just been so traumatizing on so many different levels. Let's talk about distress, how people come to consider suicide and overcoming the stigma of needing help. Clara, could you please describe how clients and their families come to you? Absolutely, and thank you all so much for allowing me the opportunity to be here. And sorry, I had a few uh, technological issues. So the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay is located in Tampa, Florida. And so individuals come to us through the National Suicide Prevention Helpline at 1-800-273-TALK. If you call that line in Tampa, Florida, you will actually reach our uh, center. Uh, we also take overflow calls from around the country. So we certainly have seen our fair share of individuals, uh, like I said, across the country. We also operate the 211 information and referral line. So we get individuals that will call us on either line that are concerned about either themselves or a loved one uh, around suicide. And so we will average anywhere between uh, 10 to 20 suicide calls that come into our center every single day. And it really does span across the age range, uh, ethnicity, uh, demographics, all the way around. Uh, it is certainly an issue that is impacting everybody in our community. And uh, Dr. Dan, uh, could you give us a sense of, of where people are coming from uh, when they are considering uh, this step? Uh, where, where do they come from? It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's medical, but it's not just medical, is it? That's correct. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, unfortunately, this is a topic that affects all of us in one way or another. Um, whether we have people in our lives that we know that struggle with mental health issues or people that struggle with thoughts of suicide or we lost someone to suicide, suicide is, is really a major problem in our world. It's a public health issue in our world. There's 800,000 people a year around the world that we're losing to suicide. And here in the United States, it's a 10th leading cause of death with somebody dying every 11 minutes. You're exactly right that this is really complicated. It's far more complex than many other illnesses that we know of because it is both internal and external. We know that some people have um, structural changes within the brain that might cause some uh, issues leading to thoughts of suicide. There might be chemical imbalances within the brain. There might be electrical circuitry problems within the brain. These are all internal kinds of things that, that really impact people. Even during adolescence, when hormonal changes happen for, for young people, we see changes within the body and within the brain that can lead to thoughts of suicide and mental health issues. At the same time, it's not just that. It also includes these external stressors and pressures. We know that uh, whether it is economic forces that impact us, whether it is financial problems, whether it is food problems, whether it is home problems where you live, could be a series of trauma that you've experienced in your life. Even uh, PTSD for those that have served in the military or have been victimized before. All of these kinds of things are external stressors. And when you have all of these things going out at the same time, and on top of that, a breakdown in coping skills, the normal things that allow us to be able to be resilient, that's when we see people really starting to struggle with suicidal thinking. I've experienced um, suicide from the point of view of people with life ending conditions and pain, um, emotional trauma, um, bipolar disorder, uh, all sorts of uh, family issues, all sorts of different directions that this can come from. 
when you think about this, Christine, when you when somebody comes through your door, you don't know where they're coming from. You don't know what their personal life is. How do you how do your people get get um, those who have these these uh, thoughts to unpack? How do your people share um, their own experiences and uh, through empathy uh, create a connection? Uh, when somebody is so close to this type of a step? Well, so I'm with the Jordan Elizabeth Harris Foundation. Jordan Harris is our legacy namesake. She took her life in 2012, shortly after being diagnosed with depression. So our focus with our agency is education and training. So we don't provide clinical services or emergency crisis services. So what we see, um, and we have a school-based program, but it's a national model called Hope Squad. And the Hope Squad uses a peer-to-peer -peer, um, model, a concept. And so we have 89 schools here in North Texas that are using the Hope Squad um, suicide prevention model, uh, which translates to about 81,000 students that we serve every year. Um, so what we're seeing specifically with our youth-based program is that um, we saw suicide attempts double from the spring to the fall, but we did not see an increase in student suicides. Um, so, so what does that mean? Um, does that mean that the students are getting help sooner than they're actually following through with completions? Um, we're also seeing um, domestic violence as a big factor associated with the students' suicidal ideation. So in the past two years, 1,200 students have been referred, suicidal students have been referred for help in the Hope Squad schools that we serve here in North Texas. So um, let's talk a little bit about where people are coming from and the age groups that are affected. Can we uh, just unpack some of the demographics surrounding suicides and in two ways. First, who is coming in? The age groups, um, the ethnic groups, uh, the income levels and so on. Who is, who is having, who is confronting these issues? And then, and then also how that works, its, works it way, its way through when suicide occurs. Um, how can we prevent suicide by uh, by placing the means for suicide more distant to the person having these thoughts. Uh, Dan, could you, could you just sort of describe um, how you see the breakdown of people who are having these, these uh, issues? Absolutely, and unfortunately, it's really throughout the lifespan. We have kids as young as five, six, seven years of age that are thinking about and actually attempting and dying by suicide. And that was a small number compared to all the rest of the groups, but it actually hits in adolescence. We have our first spike around 12, 13, 14. The major spike hits right after high school, 18, 19, 20, just as kids leave home, go to college for the first time. And then uh, if we look at the numbers, the data from the CDC, the largest numbers of people in this country that are dying by suicide are adults. They're actually middle-aged adults, 25 to 54. Tragically, however, we also have seniors that are dying by suicide. If we look at rates, that's how the government looks at rates of, of death. Death per 100,000 people. Seniors have the highest rates of suicide. So it cuts across the lifespan. In terms of race and, and other demographics, in this country, it is primarily a white Caucasian uh, tragedy. However, we do know, so, so the majority of people that are dying are white. However, we know that we've seen increases recently among African-American males, African-American Females have stayed relatively low for many, many years, but African-American male suicides is increasing, particularly young, young people. If we look at Native Americans, culturally, they have the highest rates of suicide. There's almost double the general population in the LGBTQ population. We don't actually know deaths by suicide is, is increasing. The, the data isn't ca captured for that yet but we know that they attempt more and they think about suicide more. So this is really cutting across males and females. Males die um, three times as often, females attempt four times as often. So we know gender, race uh, across the country. We know where people live makes a difference as well. Suicide occurs in more rural areas than it does in more urban areas, but it happens everywhere and across every group. We know that about 30,000 people die by suicide through handguns um, uh, every year. Uh, what other uh, means are there to, to enact these, these, uh, these very dire thoughts? Uh, Clara, Clara, could you uh, enlighten us? 
Certainly, and certainly something that we're seeing here in our community as along with the across the state of Florida is overdose deaths, um, suicide related to overdose. And I would say that that is an area that we're focused very uh, strongly on in our community. Uh, our medical examiner has been working very closely with our community mental health providers to really try to start addressing the uh, overdose, uh, suicide by overdose. But there's also hangings, there's certainly um, those individuals that jump from you know high structures, those kinds of things are all ways that we have seen in our community and across our state uh, as uh, unfortunately as means. And I think you talk about, Mark, this idea of reducing means. And I think that is an area that we all have opportunities to have discussions because you know things like gun locks, um, making sure that we've got signage available. And again, those opportunities for before somebody gets to that place, how are we as a community prepared to have those discussions with our individuals, with our friends, our loved ones, our family members that uh, that we see that are struggling and feeling comfortable having those those conversations so that when you get to that, you you never even get to that point of considering uh, lethal means. So stigma seems to play an awful big role in keeping people from sharing their distress and from from uh, working through it. It seems that part of part of your program, Christina, is to eliminate the stigma, to bring this out into the open. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. One of the training platforms that we use is called QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer. It's an evidence-based training. Um, the gatekeeper training takes about an hour. It gives people the basic skills and tools that they need to be able to help somebody who's struggling with thoughts of suicide. I think when someone is faced, actively faced with someone who's suicidal and they don't have any kind of training or information, the first thing that they feel is fear. Fear that they're not going to know what to say, fear that they're going to say something insensitive. And what the QPR training does is it, it helps people move through that process, making sure that they ask questions in a non-judgmental manner. Uh, making sure that they persuade the person, I care about you, I'm listening to you, I want you to be safe. And then the referral process is also very important too. At what stage, um, being able to determine that information, if somebody's actively suicidal, what is the next stage? Do they, do they need immediate help? Do we need to call an ambulance? Do um, we need to call a family member that can come and help them? Um, so all of these are really important um, arts, skills to have in terms of the training that we provide. I'd, I'd be very interested in talking about the role of medication and drugs, uh, because drugs are a mean, means for suicide. They can also be uh, used to help um, people get over that, that period of time. I took a, uh, a combination of drugs that were prescribed by one doctor, and it was uh, uh, basically uh, a muscle relax relaxant and painkillers. And all of a sudden my thoughts took a very dark, dark turn. So it's a really double-edged sword. Uh, Dan, when, when you look at the drug, um, the use of drugs in this environment, how do medical professionals who are prescribing these drugs uh, think about those prescriptions and the downstream impacts of prescribing different approaches? Um, to, to help to create those, those chemical rebalances, but also to avoid dangers in the future? Yeah, it's a really it's a great question. It's a tricky question. Um, medical professionals are looking at symptoms. Where are the symptoms? Because the symptoms are leading to the diagnosis. And in diagnostic categories, you have antidepressants, you have anti-anxiety medications, you have neuroleptics, which work with thought disorders like schizophrenia, uh, type illnesses. So really what the prescribers are looking at are what are the symptoms going on? Or is somebody hearing voices, hallucinating, delusional, then they need a neuroleptic. Uh, if they're struggling with depression, for example, uh, is their appetite off? Is their energy off? Because some of the medications do more to boost energy. Some of them help with sleep a little bit better. Some actually help you sleep more because you're not sleeping. And depression has all of those symptoms to it. For It really varies for people. So unfortunately, what that sounds like and actually is in reality is a bit of trial and error for people. Prescribers need to work with not only the type of medication and the brand of medication, but the dose of medication. And sometimes it's combining medications to work best for people based on what symptoms that they're having to get them through that. 
And as you mentioned, the, the real problem here is, is that we do know a very, very small number of people. It's less than 2% of people, actually, if you look at the studies around the world. And actually, the studies that were done they created what's called this black box label. That's the warning label around antidepressants that could increase risk of suicide. And none of the studies around the world did anybody die by suicide. So that's really important for people to understand. That doesn't mean, however, that there weren't increases in some people thinking about suicide, as you mentioned. We have different medicines. Heart medications actually mimic depression and create feelings of depression. Some muscle relaxants do exactly what you're talking about. This is where the, the healthcare professionals, the, the doctors, the nurses, the psychologists that are working as a treatment team need to assess what's happening within that particular body because everybody's different. So medications will be about broad-based, but everybody's system is different and look at what the potential side effects are and monitor those in the dosing. Uh, I, I postulated before we started the actual show, I postulated that, that this idea of there being people who have mental illness and people who don't, that that idea is actually incorrect. That we all have mental illness, if you're going to place it that way. It's part of the human condition. We all suffer stress, ups and downs, depression, we all have these swings. We all have our trauma that we are suppressing or dealing with. We're, we're all involved in this, in this game. And we can all at any time, at any phase in our life, for whatever reason, uh, have these downturns. How do you think about this whole idea of mental illness? Because I think that if we categorize people all of a sudden, and we, we actually create stigma. And, and part of this issue is that even to talk about this, we have to categorize, right, right, Dan? I mean, we have to, we have to place a name at it, but as soon as we place a name at it, we create stigma. Clara, could you just give a, give a, a cut on this, this issue of stigma and, and naming and? Absolutely, and you know, and Mark, I appreciate that, and, and Dan, I'm, I'm thinking about what you had said as well. So I think, first of all, in this pandemic, one of the things that we've been telling everyone who calls in to us is that it's okay to not be okay. You know, this pandemic has created a situation that none of us have ever faced. And if it was just the pandemic itself, that would be one thing. But then you add political unrest, you add social unrest. In my community, probably, Christine, for you as well, you've got all of the storms and various weather-related events. So you've got a lot of individuals that are struggling, many for the very first time. And some of the folks who have called us, as a matter of fact, have said, you know what, I didn't really believe in this thing called mental health. I just thought that that person was just weak. Or that, that was person, somebody else. Yeah, exactly. You know, suck it up, buttercup, was a lot of what people had perceived. But now you see the aha of, oh, I get it now. I can't get out of bed. I am... I, I am so anxious that I can't sleep at night. So if for, I think on the good side of things is that the pandemic has really brought to light that mental health is real and that all of us struggle. And I think to Dan, to your point, where we have, I don't maybe, maybe not necessarily recognized before is that we as individuals have lots of coping mechanisms to be able to manage that stress and anxiety. And when those coping mechanisms break down, that's when you see individuals not knowing where to go to help for help. And so I think that that's really where these discussions need to focus on is just saying to everybody, you know what? having a behavioral health issue is just like having high blood pressure or having some sort of medical condition. You recognize you have an issue, you go and you seek out treatment and help and support. And that's what we need to be saying around mental health, however we define it. If we're feeling this anxiety and this depression to the point that it's impacting our day-to-day -day life and our day-to-day -day interactions with people that we love, it's okay to reach out to get help and help works. So I think those are the messages that we have to continue to give as we are also grappling with how do we diagnose, how do we recognize, how do we, how do we get reimbursed as providers to be able to provide all of this level of service. So it's a, it's a very difficult question that we have to unpack. But at the end of the day, I think what's so important is just, again, that messaging around, it's okay to not be okay. What's not okay is not reaching out for help when you need it. Christina, how do you see this, the, the role of societal imprinting? You know, whether it's, it's based on gender, right? Men act in this way and women act in that way or, or race or, um, or uh, other factors. Um, it, it would seem that, that partly our 
desire to, um, to share with our children who we are and our traditions and so on, that that can also cause some issues when it comes to, um, to stigmatizing certain behaviors. On the one hand, right, you want to share who you are, you want to with, with, with your children. On the other hand, you might also be causing, uh, you might be the root cause of some of these, these uh, behaviors. How do you strike a right, a right balance? And we can't just all be, be fluff balls and, and not figure out, not make any decisions in our lives or not, not share anything with our children. How do, how do you find that, that balance? Well, I think, you know, what we experience here specifically in our North Texas community is, um, is there's a lot of cultural stigmas um, in terms of a suicide, talking about suicide. Um, of course, we have a large Hispanic population here. Um, fortunately, we have a bilingual program coordinator on staff who speaks fluent um, Spanish and fluent English. And um, so we, we deal with that too. And we deal with it in our schools as well. So how can we break those cultural barriers um, and, and be more sensitive? Um, it, it, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, um, making sure that, that what we do um, speaks to our entire community that we're serving, um, not just our white community, but our, our, our communities of color and, and being able to meet people where they are. And that's incredibly important. And when addressing stigma, um, it, it's you know creating that culture that encourages help seeking. And we see a lot of that within our schools that we're serving too, is that um, as our programs take root in the schools, we see our referrals increase. I think a lot of people will expect our referrals to decrease, but increasing means that that as Clara said, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to seek help. Um, it's just this big, this big picture of, of reducing stigma. And as I said, meeting people where they are culturally. You know, it's an interesting point. Uh, Dan, um, you know, part of the, the repercussions of what Christina was saying is that if you look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, we generally talk about race. But maybe we're not just talking about race. Maybe we're talking about mental health. Maybe we're talking about a whole bunch of other things that really is about empathy and listening and sort of respectful interactions across uh, barriers of age, um, circumstance, and so on. Uh, how do you see it? Is, is, is this focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, does it actually have an impact on the mental health ideas of, of how we, we uh, confront uh, this epidemic of uh, suicide and trauma? I think so, and I think so in, in a broader perspective. So if that's at the 30,000 foot level, we're talking about the 50,000 foot level that we need to all be more compassionate about each other, for each other. So I think that the, the diversity, equity, inclusion um, discussion that's happening here in our country and, and here, I'm in Minneapolis where this all really broke last year uh, mm -hmm. and continues uh, with the protests just miles from my office right now. Um, these things are bringing about the idea that we're all human and that we all have feelings and we all have experiences that are unique to each of us. And if we can start to be a little more compassionate that everybody else might have their own and we can hear more and we can ask more and we can try to understand more and better about their experience, we are all going to be better off. And in many ways that will help us not only around those diversity, equity, inclusion kinds of issues, but around mental health, because we are afraid, as you've heard both Claire and Christina talk about, we're afraid to ask about mental health issues. We're afraid we're going to lead somebody down the wrong path, and we know research says that we're not going to do that. We're afraid that we're not going to have the right answer, or we're afraid that we're going to offend somebody. But if we can listen, and we can really hear and understand, we may not be able to put ourselves exactly in their shoes. But if we can listen and try to understand and be sympathetic and compassionate, that's gonna take us a long way in helping each other with the mental health challenges that we all have. You now we just completed two polls. One was, uh, do people attending uh, the Zoom part of this call um, know anyone who was considered suicide? And 82% said yes, they, they did. 
And then when we, when we asked, uh, how do you personally view the problem of suicide? And we went from not a problem to an all hands on deck uh, issue. We had 42% um, said a problem that can be solved with strong support. There are a lot of resources to help uh, people. And, uh, and even more uh, extreme view was um, sort of an all hands on deck health issue. I mean, that's sort of where, where people were skewing. So there's a recognition that this is uh, becoming um, top of mind uh, for individuals. Let's talk about the, uh, the actions that we can take to uh, improve situations, both on the preventive side, um, but also on the intervention side. Um, let's talk about um, the latter first. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the uh, prevalence of handguns, um, not from a rights point of view. I think everybody should have the right to have any law-abiding citizen should have the right to have handguns, but there is a public health issue with so many people uh, committing suicide using handguns and, and self-harm. Um, how do you all see this, this idea of, of taking the means, whether it's drugs or handguns or, or other means, and placing it more distant from the person who uh, might have the, these issues? And, and uh, Christine, I'm going to start with you since, since you're in Texas and there have been laws to loosen up availability of, of handguns. I don't want to get into the politics of it. Sure. I'm really talking about this from, from, a, from a health uh, perspective. Well, all of this has to do with access to lethal means. And when we say access to lethal means, we know um, specifically here in Texas that 61% of all suicides um, are, are as a result of firearms. Um, 61%? So 61%. So what we want to stress in our trainings and our educations is being able to remove that access to lethal means. When you're talking to somebody who's actively suicidal, asking that question, do you have a plan? Yes, I have a plan. I have a gun. I care about you and I want to remove that gun. Um, for parents, it's making sure that their firearms are secured, that children cannot access them. Even over-the-counter drugs, we talk about prescription medications, but over-the-counter drugs, a child can take a handful of Advil and a handful of Tylenol and can die, a suicidal child, making sure that those harmless, quote unquote, harmless over-the-counter drugs are secured because when they're taken with direction, they're basically harmless, but in the hands of a suicidal child, they, they can be lethal. So a lot of that has to do with access to lethal means. And how, do, how do we deal with that? I mean, we can't outlaw uh, Advil. Um, we can't uh, outlaw Tylenol, can we? I mean, how, how do we how do we deal with that? Education. Yes, I think I think I think she's right. Education is really critically important. Uh, we need to educate parents, and we need to educate youth about safe storage of medications and what to do if they are worried about their friend who might take something that they can get access to over the counter, that they should tell somebody, they shouldn't keep that a secret. That's the educational realm of it. But in other countries uh, over in Europe, uh, Tylenol is called paracetamol. Um, there are other countries that have restricted access to paracetamol or Tylenol. There are countries that have uh, restricted access to charcoal that you can buy over the counter. We use it for uh, grilling out. People around the world actually die mostly in the method by using pesticides and by charcoal. So yes, we can use laws and legislation and we can use education, but we can use just simple means restriction about who might be purchasing some of these things and where they purchase them from. Even they might steal them from, from local stores. So there's a lot of things that we can do around those areas that, that can, can really make a significant difference. Even, even when it comes to the firearms, keeping our ammunition separate from the firearm itself makes a difference. And all of this has to do with the issue, as you've heard about access. Uh, when somebody is acutely or imminently suicidal, uh, there's a sense of impulsivity that happens for them. And the easier the access, the quicker the access, and the, the access that the person believes is going to be the one that is going to affect the outcome, is going to create the resolution to the pain. That's what they're looking for. And in, the, in this country, it's a firearm. 
if we can keep them safe, locked up, keep ammunition separate, we don't find means substitution, meaning we don't find somebody going and looking for another way to do that. Same is true around bridge, bridge barriers. If there's a bridge where somebody is jumping from or multiple people jump from, if a barrier is put up, we don't see them going to another bridge. So there are many public health things, approaches we can take. There's structural changes that we can take that can actually do a lot to save more people's lives. We just completed another poll, um, and and Christine, I'd love I'd love for you to comment on that. We 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 asked, uh, do sufficient uh, resources exist to help people who feel suicidal? Twenty percent said yes, uh, forty percent said somewhat, and forty percent said no. Um, how do you see in terms of in terms of the resources that we dedicated to uh, preventing suicide and to treating people who are in distress? Do you feel like we have enough resources? Is this a matter of having enough resources but requiring education? Or do we actually need to have further investment in, the, in these fields? Well, I do know that 65% of the communities here in Texas report that they don't have enough mental health resources. And I think that is, you know, when we get through that stage of being able to refer somebody for help, that's a huge piece, um, you know, I uh, have parents calling me all the time looking for adolescent beds in our community. Um, the, the wait, when you have to wait days, it, it's days, it's critical. Those days are critical. Um, you know, there's, there's a shortage of mental health counselors. I mean, we really need to ramp up our, our trainings and get more people into these fields trained to be able to provide that important piece. Um, and, you know, because we're non-clinical, a huge portion of what we do at the Jordan Elizabeth Harris Foundation is resource and referral. And it's so important to have those, those resources available and not have, not have to deal with the shortage in our communities. And Clara, what, what is the picture from Tampa? Um, you know, it's, it, you were mentioning, uh, the thing that I thought was really interesting about your intro element was that you were talking about the fact that there's a lot of spillover mm -hmm. um, into, into your, your folks, into, into your helpline, which, which would indicate that at times there are insufficient resources in other areas of the country. Do you feel like there need to be more resources dedicated to this public health issue? No question. You know, this is the number one preventable public health issue. It's, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it, it's absolutely out there. It's everywhere and we can present, prevent it 100% of the time. So that is the piece that I think is very important. And I would say that, you know, looking at my state, which has traditionally been underfunded in the behavioral health, you know, we usually rank around 49th or 50th. Um, in the state rankings for behavioral health spending, that the dollars that do come in are oftentimes so tied up in ways that we can't use them the most appropriate, the most effective ways that people need them. And so I think that that's the other opportunity that we have as well as a, as a nation is to look at how those dollars are being allocated and how they're being spent and who is making those decisions. Because I would, uh, I would argue that probably Dan, has a better clinical understanding of how these funds should be utilized than maybe a politician who has no background in this field. So I think that those are some opportunities for us to be able to take resources that we have and be able to use them more effectively and more judiciously. And then again, you know, back to Christine's point, you know, Christine's point, what we're seeing right now is that in our community, you're looking at six to 12 weeks wait to get in to see somebody. So from the time somebody is calling in crisis to the time they can get to a provider, that's a long period of time. And so being able to provide that bridge, we call it care coordination, to be able to have somebody that can continue to follow up with you, check in on you, you know, if you created a safety plan, helping that make sure that safety plan is still working while you're waiting to get access to those resources. We have a huge shortage in this behavioral health space. And I would argue that we're only seeing the tip of this pandemic, this uh, behavioral health tsunami that is coming our way. Because once schools fully open, once um, employers and, and employees are back together in the same environment, we are going to see an escalation in behavioral health issues uh, to the likes that we haven't seen. And we're not prepared as a behavioral health community. I think telehealth has come a long way, uh, but that's not that cannot be seen as the only uh, access or resource to behavioral health. It really needs to be a continuum. So Mark, I, I answered that question probably bigger than you wanted. The resources, we need to make the resources more flexible. The regulations need to be changed to uh, 
recognize what we are dealing with as behavioral health professionals and we need more. And I'm going to give you the last word. If there's one thing that, that you would recommend that I do, that we each do uh, to make this world a better place in this regard, what, what can I do? What would you recommend to me? So if I get to start with that, I would say oh. that it is two things. One, when somebody comes to you, take the time to listen to them and validate regardless of where you're coming from and what you believe, validate those feelings that somebody else is sharing with you and get them to an appropriate place like 211, the National Suicide Helpline. Uh, I think those are so, those are the two most important things. And Dan, what would you recommend that, that, that I do? I, I think two things. One is, is to be there and be available, uh, but to know resources. Uh, for people that are struggling with mental health issues, uh, or thoughts of suicide, uh, they, they see tunnel vision, they don't feel like there's access to anything, they don't see opportunities. If you can provide that, you can be a life-saving support system for them. So to be there and provide resources, just know what they are, that can really make a difference in terms of saving somebody's life. Be present, uh, as you say, uh, 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 Clara, um, and be knowledgeable, as you say, Dan, and uh, Christina, um, what should I do? What should, what, what should, how should I equip myself? How should I function? Well, I don't wanna sound like a broken record, but education and training is so important. You can take one of our trainings online. We have one tonight, this evening. Um, it takes about an hour and um, it's free. Uh, so, you know, I encourage people wholeheartedly to continue their, their journey in learning more about suicide prevention, but the QPR gatekeeper training is very attractive because it doesn't take days, it takes an hour, and it gives you the basic skills and tools that you need to be able to, to, to save a life from suicide. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Clara Reynolds, President CEO of the Christ Center of Tampa Bay, uh, uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Reidenberg, uh, Am I pronouncing your your last name correctly, uh, yep. Dan? Yes, right. <laughs> Great. Executive Director of Safe Suicide Awareness Voices of Education in Minnesota. And Christina Judge, Executive Director of the Jordan Elizabeth Harris Foundation in Texas. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your insight into this uh, very important, sensitive topic. Thank you, attendees, for helping us with your questions. And uh, that's the nonprofit report. We'll see you on Tuesday, where we'll be talking about uh, prison reform. Uh, again, another, another area where we're talking about uh, trauma, we're talking about healing the nation and changes that we can make to make America a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.